I think we're on. Are we on? Yeah, we are on, Dr. B. Hey, guys, on YouTube, uh, Tyler Holm and myself here. Uh, today's talk. Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, I'm proud that uh, the videos are regularly coming up now as I'm in the middle of my methamphetamine or my stimulant series. I like the videos, but they might be too long-winded. Uh, Power Homes with me today, and uh, the generating topic of discussion is the impact of drugs and alcohol uh, on uh, parents or parenting. I left it vague on purpose. I want Power Home to go where he wants to go with that. I have my own ideas. As always, everybody, pop on there, ask your questions, give your thoughts. We're cool if you disagree with us. Educate us on your experiences. Parham, hello, how are you? Nice to have you on. Thank you, Dr. B. Uh, really happy to be here again, everyone. You look great. I like the doctor scrubs. I like that uh, outfit you got going on there. Um, and thank you for taking time out of your clinic, by the way, to uh, do this for the viewers and your audience. Uh, I know it means a lot to me, so I'm sure it means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, I appreciate your time, Doc. And, and I really do look forward to opening up this topic of the impact of addiction uh, into the family, primarily the impact that it has on children, because um, whether the children are young right now or one day they will be older, the impact that happens in childhood later on becomes the impact that an adult child uh, of an alcoholic or, or addict one day will have. So uh, I feel competent and confident on the topic. I really hope that whatever we talk about um, creates a discussion and a lot of questions start coming in because I do believe that a combination of Dr. B and Parham today will be able to uh, answer a lot of questions and provide a lot of support. Parham, um, I should thank you for joining me to uh, giving me a, a breath of fr fresh air with a, a view that I respect and you know how I look at these things and uh, bringing us the mental health aspect. I know you run a very successful uh, uh, um, intensive outpatient partial hospitalization. I don't think you guys do detox and uh, that keeps you busy and uh, you're the clinical director there. So uh, we thank you for joining us and the viewers, uh, I'm sure really appreciate it. Um, yeah, let's, uh, this is uh, uh, one of those topics I'm becoming more and more passionate about uh, for personal reasons, uh, the impact of uh, dysregulated parents or family uh, structure and the profound uh, impact on children. Um, uh, let's start with your thoughts. Or if you well, want, whatever you want. No, let's, and the guys, uh, we're trying to keep an eye on that. Parham's better. I'm not a good multitasker, but uh, let's start with Parham's thoughts. Sure, man. So just so everybody knows, um, I'm actually the I'm in operations and program directing, if you will. Um, we do have a clinical director. He's, he's a brilliant man. His name is Eric Ochoa. So I'm not the clinical director at our place, but I have wore that hat before. And for everyone that's watching this for the first time, uh, hello to all the people saying hello. And I do have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy with an emphasis in child development. Wow. Uh, I didn't yeah. know the child development part. Uh, yeah, on top of, uh, you know, the, the licensed advanced alcohol and drug counseling component. So the part about the child development, you know, what we really look at is lifespan development across the timeline, you know, of not just the time the child is, you know, in, in early, um, you know, three, four, five years old, those stages of development. But as they as they go on seven, eight, nine years old, 12, 13, 14 years old, 18, 19, 20 years old, all of this, all of this timeline has uh, interconnectedness and the environment that one is coming up through this whole process matters, okay? So when we're talking about the impact of addiction on the family, first of all, as I hope everyone knows, there's about 22, 23 million people that are diagnosed with alcoholism, okay? So, and there's another eight to nine million people that are diagnosed with illicit drug dependency. So when you add all this up, this isn't just something that's happening to a couple families here and there. This is something that's happening to families all across our country all across the world, but those are the statistics for the United States. So when you're talking about 23 to 30 million people impact, that's only reported cases, by the way. Those are people that have been reported. They've, they've had some type of assessment. They've had some type of a, a documentation. They've had some type of treatment episode. They've, they've reached out to a doctor. They've gone to a clinic. Those are all the reported. So imagine what's going underreported. But what the most important part here for everyone to know is this, is addiction impacts the psychological, emotional, 
physical um, development of a human being. Okay, so how does it do those things? It's really important to just kind of break this down piece by piece and look how it how it goes down. So when a mom or a dad comes home and they're addicted to drugs and alcohol. Okay, so let's just keep it very, very basic. Now, this could be a family member that's even present inside the home. Maybe they don't even act out in certain overt ways that you're like, oh, this is an alcoholic that has really overt, negative, bad behaviors. However, there's something that I'm really big on. It's called emotional proximity. Now, a family member can be under the influence, drunk or under whatever influence, and they could be around their children. However, when you're under the influence, are you really there? Are you really physically present? Are you able to allow your child to feel safe, comfortable in their own skin? Is the child able to feel attached? Is the child able to feel love, warmth? Are they able to express their needs? Are they able to communicate? All of these things become really important in the emotional development of a child. Now, when you add addiction in there, what else happens, right? There's usually suppressed emotions. There's usually a passive aggressive communication. There's usually some possible, and I'm not saying always, but possible abuse, psychological, emotional, physical, spiritual abuse. So when you go through all these realms, there's a significant impact on addiction, on the development of the child. And later on in life, I'm going to give you guys just a few of these, and I'll let Dr. B kind of open this up the way he does so, so uh, eloquently. But an adult child of an alcoholic, later on in life, these are some of the things that may or may not happen to them, but it's very common. So one, they have this overwhelming sense of guilt or they're really the overwhelming sense of shame. And they always feel like they need to do something to get the admiration of love or others. So their self-worth in that case is really low because it was never fed appropriately through the proper channels, if you will. They have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. They feel like they are responsible for others. Now, if you're coming up in a home and you have a mom or dad that's addicted and you're one of the children growing up and you're the oldest child, you know how that thing plays out? You might have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility for taking care, care of the siblings. You might have the parentified role. You might be the person that's in charge of doing things that you're not supposed to be doing until you're 20, 30 years old at the age of six or seven. Uh, they also learn how to stuff their emotions and suppress their emotions. So later on in life, when they're going to, in a personal relationship for themselves and someone says, what's going on with you? They don't have the words to articulate what it is that they feel because they never developed them as a child. They might start to have the sense of anger with confrontation, right? They might be afraid of people that get loud, that people that get combative, that people have a confrontation. So they suppress that also. They become approval seekers. They're always seeking for approval of others because, and, and they have this pursuit of perfectionism because if they're not perfect, then the world might not accept them. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here that um, it impacts, you know, on a multi different facet. So I'm really excited to see what people have specific examples. But Doc, I'll pass it over to you. And, and, and like I said, I'm really passionate about this topic. I do a lot of things for family recovery on my own on the on the weekends, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit over here too. But uh, go for it, man. I'm, I'm interested to see what you have to say. You know, essentially what you're saying, I, I just want to kind of broaden it and uh, point even further into the details uh, and this is a topic uh, that's uh, really big on my radar as well. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll point this out. When we're talking about uh, substance abuse and in particular alcoholic parents, parenting or uh, most uh, oftentimes, the problem is much larger than that because usually there's mental health issues uh, associated or as a causal mechanism for the alcoholism with one or the other or both parents, which means they already are suffering from uh, very common uh, personality disorders that is tied into the alcoholism, okay? So now this blows this issue up even bigger because if there was not alcoholism, uh, or, uh, uh, or or um, um, substance abuse, their parenting is already questionable with a potential for an explosive impact of adverse childhood events and the stress physiology on that child, which will affect them for years to come. Now you add the alcohol, okay, uh, or, uh, or the substance abuse. And just recently this topic has really turned into, as we know, 
substance and alcohol abuse, we all, you know, uh, there's that uh, neurocircuitry reward system model that we use in clinical medicine and sort of laboratory science. Now they're starting to look at how the, they're looking at the circuits through neuroimaging and evaluating parenting through all these, uh, through that, which is really interesting. And they're starting to see, you know, things like, look, you can't, you know, you were talking about if someone's loaded and uh, can they really appreciate their child? They're starting to see that whether you're loaded or not, if you got these other problems, you can't even pick up the appropriate cues from your infant to react in the appropriate way that will give the feedback response to that child to appropriately develop. It's huge, okay? And oftentimes when you start to get the substance abuse and alcoholic parents, and then you throw in mental health issues that put them in that place in the first place, now you start to see people that have uh, risky and impulsive behavior as it is with the substance abuse, it's added. Now that's gonna have an effect on the child, the decisions they make, how they make their decisions. You know, let's say if someone's extremely promiscuous, okay, uh, you know, you're going to be exposing someone very young to potential uh, communicable or infectious diseases that you don't even know what you're doing, okay? In addition to that, as these kids are starting to come up, all the things that you, oh, in a, you know, before I get there, one other thing, oftentimes these issues not always, but oftentimes these issues are very, very intimately tied into some other social markers and public health markers. Lack of education, okay? Lack of financial resources, okay? Every decision that parent makes uh, is off, and they're, they're not motivated to uh, do the right thing for different reasons, but every decision that a parent makes uh, may be lacking, right? I'll give one example that I recently came across. Uh, uh, and this one is a little abstract. You have to, I guess, uh, really uh, be a clinician. You know, going to the doctor or to the hospital uh, can do extensive potential harm to a child, okay? You know, the person who may be not as educated as their counterpart doesn't have the social means to have an appropriate doctor call. You know, they start going to the doctor, they're loaded, the kid has this. Well, this has potential long-term impact on the child, believe it or not, unnecessary testing, additional exposure to infectious disease, right? So uh, uh, I just recently read the uh, Surgeon General of uh, California actually considers uh, uh, adverse childhood events an epidemic in California, uh, it is considered an epidemic uh, across the country and to a certain extent, the world. Uh, and, uh, and this just severely contributes to that. And uh, I can tell you, uh, uh, it is difficult being the child of an alcoholic, extremely difficult to be the child of an alcoholic or a drug user. Uh, so, uh, in fact, one of the outcomes of all of this and ch adverse childhood events, besides the 18, uh, literally 18 other uh, long-term chronic disease outcomes, is substance abuse and alcohol, which is one of the things you and I, why you and I are so deeply interested in the history of our patients and clients uh, in their long-term recovery. Yeah, man. I mean, one of the adverse childhood experience questions on the questionnaire is, did you, were you raised with one or both parents who were addicted to alcohol or drugs or, you know, mental illness? Were they ever incarcerated or, or sent off for extended period of time to treatment? Um, was there any type of, you know, mental depression, all that kind of stuff? But I will tell you this, whenever I talk about addiction in the family, a lot of people like to say, uh, hey, it's a genetic thing. We have it. My, my, my dad had it. My grandpa had it. And they, they, they jump to conclusions thinking that just because addiction is happening in multi different generations, that it must be genetic. However, there's something that I want everyone here to listen to 
that the environment produced by alcoholism or drug addiction is a certain type of environment. It's often cold. It's often um, uncomfortable. It's often scary for the child growing up in it. There's not a lot of space and room for communication and healthy attachment and, and, and uh, expression of emotion. There's not a lot of room for making mistakes. There's not a lot of room for um, processing you know, the, the human experience. So when that child starts to get older and they start to seek out addictive behaviors or substances, processes, you talked about promiscuity being one of them, but they use substances, they use drugs, they use people, and all of a sudden they're doing the exact same thing that their, their generation before them did. Some people want to say it's genetics, but hey man, the environment got passed down. The environment can recreate and reproduce addiction, alcoholism, drug dependency. So it's not so much the gene getting passed down, but it's the same environment over and over and over getting passed down, which that environment creates the, it's like the, the perfect ecosystem for addiction to, to, to manifest and get created. So uh, I know you kind of agree with that one too. I've heard you share before that um, you, you believe that genetics, like the nature is the bullet, if you will. And yeah, you say nature is the bullet and nurture is the trigger? No, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, nature is loading the gun. Yeah. Nurture is pulling the trigger. I love that, by the way. I love that so much. I, I stole it from somebody and I can't remember who That's someone that much smarter than me. Uh, but uh, what you said, in fact, uh, is so correct because uh, even the National Academy of Sciences and the white paper, it wasn't a white paper, actually, the report they wrote on we need to get on this uh, adverse childhood experience thing. We know for a fact that this stuff is intergenerational and we also know it can be changed. So so there goes the genetic thing. Uh, uh, and, and uh, not, you know, it, it, your susceptibility is there with the genetics, but uh, it can absolutely be the course can be changed. It's a lot of work, man, but uh, it can be changed. So it's a big thing. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't, I'm getting more and more into this topic uh, as uh, uh, time goes on and uh, looking at this stuff. Let me uh, let me look at some of these. Uh, um, the comments? Yeah, yeah. So somebody was on the uh, let's go. Oh, there's Diana. I just saw her picture. Hi, Diana. There's a Nicole. Yeah, as doctors going through these, I know there's a lot of people. First of all, there's a lot of uh, people celebrating various lengths of sobriety, clean time, uh, which is great, man. This is what this uh, support community is for. It's for you to come here and just feel connected. Um, and I'm really personally happy to see some of that. Uh, but if anybody does have any questions and wants to come up here and talk to us, Nicole just posted that um, StreamYard link. It's as simple as clicking on it and you will come in. Your screen is going to pop up. You don't have to show your face if you don't want to. We would like you to. Uh, and you can start asking any questions you want, even if it's not on the topic. We can pretty much find a way to relate everything related to addiction on this. And uh, Dr. B, I saw that Abe, which was, I believe, from India, just said that he's, three, he's, he's clean for... Uh, a couple, a month and a half now, or something like that. I read it somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah, one month and a half. And uh, hey, uh, TikTok guys, uh, again, I don't have my glasses, uh, so you guys uh, go on YouTube and ask your questions. I, I'll see a hi or something, and I'll wave. But go on YouTube, Doctor B Addiction Recovery. We're on live. You can come on and ask anything you want. Uh, hi, Marilyn. Uh, here's the link that Nicole put up, guys. Yeah, down there, Katie, you just said, do I ask here? I think you also said a few good comments about multi-generational trauma. Yeah, you can you can pop up and ask us, or you can uh, just type it there and we can answer it. Preferably, click the link and come on. And Misty, in two days, you'll have two years clean. Congratulations. That's awesome. I want you to. Let's see. God, there's a lot of chatter. Uh, there's Dan Hooks. He's uh, let's get Dan Hooks up here. Hi, Dan. Hi. How you doing, sir? Hi. How are you? Um, hanging in there. My, I was taking Xanax, and uh, also take pain medicine because I broke my back, and my psychiatrist got on to me about. 
uh, me taking pain medicine. Well, anyway, he wanted me to give us some of, some of them, and I said, you break your back. And anyway, he took my Xanax, knocked me down from two and a half milligrams to one, and I, I'm having real bad uh, heart populations and uh, shoulder blade neck pain, and I need to get this straightened out. I don't know how to do it. Can you go back to him and tell him, uh, look, I'm having pretty hardcore withdrawals. Uh, uh, why don't you uh, taper me appropriately if you feel that this is in, I don't know how much pain meds you're on, but can you go back and talk to him and say, listen, uh, you just uh, cut me by 60%. I'm having pretty severe withdrawals. It's very uncomfortable and I have broken back. Why don't we negotiate and... Uh, do a more, much more reasonable taper than the way you do that. Can you do that, Dan? He, he dealt me, didn't want to talk to me. I had to go to another doctor. He saw me for about one month, and I just keep getting kicked. They're kicking the can down the road. I'm only taking three Norco a day, sometimes two. That's really nothing. I don't see what the problem is. Oh, but doctor, your, your microphone just went mute, Dr. B. Dan, hold on one second. Dr. B, your microphone's mute. Oh, great. He'll, he'll be back, Dan. Don't worry. He's got you. Okay. The doctors, I'm fighting with the doctors, and I'm on doctor number four. Five now, I get one prescription and they give me to another doctor or tell me to find another psychiatrist. It's just, it's ridiculous. What's, what state are you in? I'm in Texas. As I was saying, I only take two, two pain pills. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're all, uh, they're worried uh, because of, uh, sort of the new attitude of mixing benzos and the opiates of respiratory depression. How long do you need to stay on the pain pills? Uh, well, my, I, I'm going to be on them for a, a few more years, probably. I, I broke my back. I've got severe sciatica. major problems throughout my back. I've got bulging disc, and, uh, and I just hurt all over. Well... One of the things you can do, Dan, also is potentially find a doctor that uh, understands and is willing for that pain to prescribe buprenorphine products, Suboxone products. Now, when you do that, if they really understand the mechanism of that drug, uh, then at that point, uh, they will be more comfortable putting you on a benzo and discussing a long-term taper if that needs to be. You'd have to discuss with them. That's another option you have. I do understand why they would don't want to put you on full opiate agonists and benzos, uh, and it takes a lot of monitoring, and if something goes wrong, they're, you know, it's their neck. Uh, but nevertheless, one solution, uh, and sometimes I get patients like that where, well, they'll come to me, it's a pain management issue. No one will deal with them. Exactly the same situation. And uh, uh, I, I'm like, I do not prescribe uh, full opiate agonists. I got two patients in my practice of, I don't know, a few hundred that uh, are on that. So I say, if you want, you have this chronic pain issue. I'm happy to switch you to a buprenorphine product, which is much stronger and better in the long run than what you're on. And then at that point, we can evaluate and uh, continue your benzos, but under my guidance and the way I want to do it without making you uncomfortable. That's one option that you have. Uh, if you're interested, fly out here. I'll see you. Unfortunately, I can't see you. Uh, uh, you're in Texas, but uh, sometimes people come out. I got a lady coming out from uh, Indiana tomorrow at noon just for an office visit. And there's a few like that. Again, uh, that's... Uh, there's nothing we can do about that because of uh, laws, but uh, uh, some patients do that, come out every three months uh, and uh, get managed appropriately. If not, and uh, that's not a possibility for most people, find somebody that understands the Suboxone product and uh, giving benzos and be fully honest with them. That would be my suggestion. 
because uh, uh, I understand the situation you're in. To some extent, I understand uh, the doctor's situation uh, or how they uh, perceive it. Uh, and you might have to find an addiction doctor that understands Suboxone to this extent. Um, well, and I hope that helps. The, how's this going to do it? To, I mean, I, everything's going fine. I got put on this in the 80s, and all of a sudden, here lately, I haven't found, been able to find the right doctor here now to catch a girl. So I'm the bad guy. I don't see why I'm not addicted. Yeah, and uh, this is a difficult situation. And again, this is just the way our system uh, works at this time. It's quite reactionary. And uh, I think a lot of people fall through the cracks in this very situation that you're in. Uh, and uh, it's tough. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, it is what it is. You can't tell the physician, hey, do this. You know, It depends on his understanding and his comfort level and the amount of monitoring he wants to do. Uh, but, uh, but, but I will tell you this, more than likely, if you do find what I'm telling you, the Suboxone product, you're going to be extremely happy with its pain relief. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that's the best I can do from here uh, to Texas. Uh, and I do feel you and empathize you. Parham, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I've been miserable and I've not been able to be comfortable. And, and populations and everything, it's just, it's almost too much. I mean, my heart just feels like it slammed into my chest. Uh, but say that my blood pressure is fine. You're, you're breaking up. Can you say that again? I said I checked my blood pressure and it's fine, but I have a lot of heart populations. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's uh, no, co common and normal. Uh, when they do this kind of withdrawal. Uh, also, on the other hand, uh, over time, uh, it should uh, get much, much, much better. Uh, nevertheless, how many, how long has it been now? September, I started tapering down from two and a half milligrams. I tapered down to one milligram. And uh, that's, when I go below one and a half milligrams, I have problems. Huh. So nine months. Yeah, yeah, they got to do a much slower taper than that, and uh, and uh, like uh, being this far away, uh, uh, that is the best I can give you. And I'm uh, I feel really bad for your plight. A lot of people get in this situation, and I understand it. But uh, uh, you're gonna have to. Uh, uh, what city are you in? I'm in Laporte, just outside of Houston. Uh, are you retired? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. That's a that, that's the best advice I can give. Param, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would like to add, and and, and Dan, um, my heart goes out to you, man. You sound like a good guy, and you sound like you're uh, in a lot of physical pain. And and I will tell you this as a clinician, you know, that I deal with mental health. Uh, you know, the the emotional pain and psychological pain, which is something you're also going through, not just the physical pain that's in your disc and as a result of breaking your back, like just the frustration, the stress, the the anxiety, everything you're going through as a result of the, the way the doctors are managing your, your medication or not managing your medication, all of that also accumulates the physical pain. Like it actually adds to your physical pain, believe it or not. And my hope is the same way that you were able to get on here and seek some support and talk to Dr. B and myself, and it does, it, it does allow your voice to be heard. It allows you to kind of have a say in your own treatment. And it, and it, it brings down, the, the, it brings down that, that tension and that stress just a little bit. And my hope is that you find some type of a pain support relief group, something that you can, a support group, something, a clinician, a therapist, you know, that, that potentially works with your insurance, somebody that you can sit down with and talk to, because it's just as important to get right inside the mind when you're dealing with chronic pain as it is to get right within your physical body when you're dealing with chronic pain. Uh, absolutely, and, uh, and, I, I, and I agree with that 100%. Uh, but uh, again, I don't know what services and uh, what uh, local uh, uh, 
clinical access you have. Uh, and again, uh, like uh, Param said, uh, there's a lot of mental health hygiene you can do to cope with this. And it is not your fault. You're right. But this is the situation we're in. Meanwhile, keep in mind, over time, this should get better. One thing I do recommend is stay extremely hydrated because one of the things that's happening in your shoulders and back is, uh, I don't know if people know, but benzodiazepines are muscle relaxants. And so they just yank the dosing down too fast, too hard. And the way to uh, combat, one way to combat that is uh, through hydration. Uh, and I don't know if you get physical activity. I also recommend you uh, uh, try and get some physical activity. Believe it or not, that really, really helps not just with the central nervous system aspect of it, but locally at the neuromuscular access. Yes, sir. I, I go walking down the beach. I go fishing. I got a canoe. I go out in the canoe. I try to put myself around, you know, the water in peaceful, peaceful areas. I try to, I've been isolating myself because I've been so miserable that, uh, I do get out, but I stay to myself. It's turning me into a hermit. And it's this wild. is dumb. So are you saying I got to go to a, like a withdrawal and get off of them just because the doctor got mad at me? Uh, uh, yeah, repeat the last part. Withdrawal and get off of what? I had to get off the, my medicine because the doctor got mad at me? It's not the, uh, I don't know if the doctor got mad at you. Uh, that's not the why. Uh, I think it's an issue of the sort of the atmosphere, uh, the current atmosphere uh, after the opiate epidemic uh, and prescribing, uh, over prescribing in conjunction with the fact that in general, it's not bad thinking that you shouldn't prescribe benzos and opioids in general. Now, I won't speak about the specifics. That's something uh, that's a much more complex uh, discussion. And so from that is derived attitudes within the profession uh, in regards to uh, the, this prescriptions. Now, again, I'm not addressing how we got here and all that stuff, uh, uh, but that's this is where the, uh, those guys are all at. Okay. Man, this will be tough. Uh, um, I think you, you can, you'll get through this and uh, uh, c come back on and tell us how it's going every week because I think it's uh, – uh, I'm sure you're strong enough to get through this, and I think it's going to get better over time. And do seek out the kind of care that I told you. Okay, uh, so just – give up trying to win this battle and just let them run the show? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I would call that winning the battle. I mean, you could continue to seek a physician that will prescribe you both and is comfortable with it. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, and maybe you'll find one. Uh, but, uh, you know, the advice that I could, to the extent I can give you advice on here is that, uh, uh, consider switching over to an uh, agonist antagonist. Stay well hydrated. Uh, do some exercise and uh, uh, be really honest with them. Say, look, I'm going through kind of chronic withdrawals here, and maybe they'll slow down the taper. So there's quite a few options there for you, Dan. Uh, uh, and again, it's not your fault you're in this position, but uh, sadly, it is what it is. Uh, and those are the options that I can think of in this uh, format. Okay. Okay. I hope that helps. Thank you. We wish you luck and let us know how it's going. All right. Y'all take care. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Uh, that, that's tough. Um, yeah. um, uh, let me, uh, you know, there's a lot of good questions on TikTok regarding uh, this issue. And those of you guys that are, uh, asking questions, go on the channel, Dr. B Addiction Recovery YouTube, come on up. And I saw someone saying they have something to share uh, their story uh, and they should share it. 
Uh, Power, I'm going to go back on here. See if you see any cool questions. Okay, I'll give you a timestamp if there is. Uh, yeah. There's no really questions that I see. It's just people supporting each other. Yeah, I'm looking to you. Yeah. There's this um, Chanel Paris that has been able to stay clean for three months and at Time stamp 522, she said, I never thought I would overcome opioid and benzodiazepine addiction, but then I watched your channel. So um, I believe we've talked to her once. Her name sounds really familiar. But 522. 522. It was just a nice shout out to your channel. Hi, Misty. Uh, it's another 522. Yeah, Misty. Misty's also almost two years clean in a couple of days. So we're proud of Misty. Chanel Paris at 522. Okay, I'm getting to her. I'm getting to her. Here's one for us. Uh, yeah, this one's cool too. My partner's in college and would love you to do a talk discussing uh, being heavily in. Uh, tell me what I mean, we do. We uh, This is an ongoing thing. Uh, what does Katie mean by that? Because we absolutely uh, uh, hold that position. I think both of us, uh, this, the notion of substance abuse being heavily uh, influenced by environment, uh, Meaning that substance abuse occurs because of environment? Is that what she's saying? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Katie, that's absolutely, uh, that's the cornerstone of my uh, clinical position uh, as a physician, which I guess would be weird. Uh, but I think that's uh, more important to address than anything. Uh, but uh, if that's what you're asking, and I know Parham, I'll let him uh, comment on that himself, but I think he has... Uh, the same yeah, Katie, um, hopefully you come on and talk to us. That'd be cool. But I do believe in that. So I believe human beings are, are living organisms. All living organisms develop in a moment-by-moment-by-moment -moment -moment interaction with their environment. So there is no way that a human being can become what it becomes without the environment having significant impact and influence on its development or lack thereof. So addiction is one of the byproducts of an unhealthy environment. I strongly believe that. And we, we talk about this all the time. So um, we do have a few videos in the, in the past. If you go look up our live streams with Dr. B, uh, I think you'll appreciate some of the direction we go there. Okay. There's a bunch of uh, Hella363. I keep telling on TikTok, and there's a bunch of other questions, and they're like, please answer my question, but I can barely see uh, uh, Parham. Uh, I don't know why you guys don't go on here. Hella, what did you ask? Uh, 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 let me go over here. And answer Chanel. Maybe in the future we should have you control this. And I, you know what? That's something we can do. I, I, you know, have, because some people might not be able to get on YouTube. But let's uh, have you control this. But let's look at the one you were joining. Nicole, yeah. uh, Nicole's here. Hi, Nicole. Uh, if, you get, if you want to get Katie's uh, question off too, Doctor B, just so we have the full screen back. Oh, Katie. What's no. up, Nicole? Not Hi, much. Nicole. I wanted to come on and tell everyone that's watching in TikTok land and YouTube land to come on up and ask some questions. Don't be shy. Um, look at me. I'm doing it. I, I thought I would share a little bit um, about my experience coming off Benzos to maybe give Dan a little bit of um, a little bit of hope. You know, I know that for me, it was like. I came off of them and I thought I was never going to feel like a normal person again. And slowly but surely over a couple months time, I started to feel good again, like a normal human being. And now I've been on Benzos for over almost six years now. July 13th will be six years sober. Six years. 
And so I can't even believe it. Like I'm tripping. Um, but I just don't want you to be discouraged. And the best thing that you can ever do, like, like Dr. B was saying, it's talk to your doctor, be honest, sit down with them, get to their level, let them look you in the eyes and see the way you're feeling and, and open up to them and really let them know like, I'm in a bad place. If you do that and they still don't hear you, um, you can always give us a call on the 1-800 number. And I have a couple of friends that live in Texas that see some pretty amazing doctors. Um, but my friend that's in Texas, she's on uh, medication assisted treatment and she's also prescribed Klonopin. So maybe uh, the doctor that she sees could help you out in Texas. But I just wanted to give you some words of encouragement and anybody y'all come on up and share with us because I really love hearing when you guys share because it gives me hope and encouragement also. Okay. Thank you. Nicole. How are you, Nicole? Oh, you know, I'm doing good. I'm about to hit 90,000 people over there on TikTok. Um, we've been going live every single night doing our recovery support group meetings every night. And so after I get done here with you guys, I'm going to go over there and do a recovery group and then I'll go to bed and then I'll do it again tomorrow. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you look uh, happy. That's good. Uh, uh, I am. We haven't uh, chatted in a few days, but uh, soon we will chat. I'm a uh, uh, long, busy day, but I'm hanging in there. Holler at me later when you're not busy, okay? Got it. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to read these. Hi, my name is Dana. I'm honored to be on... Uh, Dana, I can't... Uh, on your live... Come, uh, Dana, come on. Uh, oh, is she on? Oh, there's... Who's... Oh, Katie? Okay. What do I do here? There's Chanel and Katie. Did I screw something up? Oh, are you? Hi, Katie. Can she hear us? Hey. I think she can hear us. Um, I can kind of hear you, but it's really choppy. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, yeah, can, we can hear you. Yeah. Doctor B, can you take Nicole off? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you hear us now? Uh, say something. Okay, um, I'll just talk. It's really choppy to hear you. Um, that's a little bit better. Um, uh, so I was. Oh, we lost her, but I think she'll be back. Yeah, I think it's her side, not ours. Uh, can you hear me fine? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, so I think it was her. Katie, get back on, ask your question. I saw your question somewhere floating around. I think it was from your end, Katie. So uh, 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 come on, come on, come on and ask us. Uh, look, you guys keep asking, can Suboxone ruin kidneys? No. Uh, and somebody asked something else, and I can't, uh, I keep losing this. Guys on TikTok, get over there and ask your question. We're here. Chanel, what was I the one you wanted me to put up? It was Chanel. She she wrote something, um, just saying that she, thanks to your channel, she's been able to get some help and relief in sobriety. Oh, good, Chanel. Thank you. We were happy about that. Katie is from New Zealand, I believe, or uh, one of the countries. So maybe yeah, there's something. Maybe there's some um, bandwidth, you know, internet stuff going on. Oh, wow. I want to go to New Zealand. I think it was uh, New Zealand. I'm pretty sure. There's Katie. Katie, get back on here. Uh, I think it was. Uh, she's from Australia. That's why I oh. think she's been happy. Was it Australia? Okay. Yeah. Australia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Australia. Yeah. And I was really curious what she had to say. I think her husband uh, uh, was incarcerated or something. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, what she's saying uh, uh, on this issue. All right, let me look, go down here. Uh, oh, there's Katie. Let's see if we can get her on. And then Katie, get, get, get your nose coming too. All right, you know what it was? Okay, let's see. I think it was just a bad connection. But, okay, um, so I am, I'm living in Australia and um, my partner is in a new prison. 
And uh, I was essentially just wondering, um, I don't know if you're aware, but um, drug use is a huge issue in um, corrections, in um, in prison. Um, and I feel like they use it to cope. And it's, I mean, it must be, I don't, I'm not a drug user myself and I never have been. I, like, I've got my own addictions, but um, more in the way of like food and that kind of thing. But um I suppose my question is, how, what are your tips for someone who is in that kind of situation where they're reluctant to ask for help, obviously, um, because of the repercussions? Uh, and, you know, um, how, how can they essentially, um, you know, tackle their demons and not relapse over and over again? Um, when in that environment, because I think a lot of it is to do with environment. Uh, you're talking about someone in prison, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tom, you want to go first, or what? Tell me. Uh, you you probably can uh, uh, speak more eloquently to this. Uh, I have my own thoughts, but if you want to, I think Katie asked uh, for advice for somebody who's in an environment conducive to use uh, being in prison and uh, how they can reach out for help. I, I, I believe that's what you asked, Katie, right? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Well, a, 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 an inmate is never going to ask for help because, of course, they're not going to ask corrections or, you know, I'm using because they'll be the high security, you know, that they'll yeah. be reprimanded. But I think that an addict needs, you know, obviously treatment rather than just um, punishment. And so what would be your advice for someone who is using inside um, to, you know, for themselves without any resources um, so that they don't just relapse again and again? Because it's a vicious cycle and it's all, it's all through the prison system, at least here in Australia and in New Zealand. I have a question for you. When you're saying, uh, thanks, uh, we just had Dr. G stop in here. Uh, uh, when you say repercussions, uh, do you mean uh, from the other inmates or from the uh, prison staff uh, or from uh, whatever the, yeah. Yeah, the the prison staff? Uh, you, yeah, usually from prison staff, but possibly also other inmates. You know, if they know that you have something, of course, they're going to like. Um, take it from them. Okay. All right. Uh, Arash, uh, any thoughts? I mean, Arash, uh, Param, I'm sorry. Any yeah, thoughts? Um, <clears throat> Katie, thank you for coming and asking this question. Um, it's a really challenging situation, I understand, for you to be in and also for your uh, partner. How long is he, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, you don't have to be exact, but how long is he incarcerated for? Um, he's been in He's been sort of in and out all of his life, um, okay. which is often the case, but he, um, he's got possibly another five years. He's, he, he got 15 and he's, he's technically got another 10, but I think he'll be out in another five, about five years. Okay. Um, so I'm going to answer this in two parts, if that's okay. Uh, the, the, the first part, how you say he's been in and out, it's not just the environment inside the jail and the environment inside the prison that needs to uh, change. It's also the environment when he's outside of prison. I know we're a few years out from this, but you know the, the recidivism, which leads people back and forth into the prison system and the substance use cycle and the addiction cycle, it doesn't just happen when they're in the environment of the jails. It's often the environment outside the jail, which leads them back into that same environment, right? So when people are getting clean and sober, they say there's only one thing they got to change. And that one thing is everything. You know, that one thing is everything. And oftentimes letting go of a certain lifestyle, letting go of certain people in a lifestyle, letting go of certain behaviors in a lifestyle. When they choose to hold on to those things, for whatever reasons they hold on to them, it leads them back to this vicious cycle of going in and out of incarceration. Now, since he's already in there and he's going to be there for a while, I don't know much about the New Zealand or Australian uh, prison systems or jail systems. I, I, to be honest with you, I really don't. So I don't know what kind of resources and support is available in the jails. 
I know that over here in the U.S., we actually do offer support groups. We actually do mm-hmm. offer, uh, f- you know, physicians, doctors that they can talk to. We actually do offer people that go into the jails. You know, they're called hospitals and institution panels. They go in there and they share their experience, strength, and hope. So, if, first of all, before I say anything too ignorant, is there anything available inside of the Australian or New Zealand jail system for support if he chooses to seek it? There is. There's programs, especially when they're looking at transitioning out of um, out of okay. prison and going to become self sufficient But the mentality is that they would that otherwise they wouldn't ask for help because if you know if imagine an inmate says you know reaches out and says oh you know I'm struggling with meth addiction um, and he you know reaches out to a social worker his social worker might. Have you know, a moral obligation or a legal obligation to on, and then they're, you know, like red hot as they call it in the prison and, um, you know, corrections will find out, like the officers will find out and then, you know, and then their life just becomes more difficult. So um, it's a real, like, breeding ground for not only mental health issues but, um, you know, it's all continued substance abuse and I think that's part of the... Yeah, part of the issue. It's just like a like a cesspit of of um yeah, addiction and, and mental health issues. And I suppose like I was just my initial question was just what would your recommendation be for um uh, for I guess someone helping themselves when they don't have the resource so when they're not um when they can't access rehab. They just come down in their cell. It really must be very difficult. It, it, now my I suppose uh, is he go ahead answered it though your, um, is he interested in uh, becoming oh, um, so I think um Param go ahead at the moment he's doing well at the moment at the moment I have a, he doesn't always tell me but at the moment I think he's not using um but it's you know always in the back, I can always tell when he does, you know, he gets a weird haircut and physical changes and just his mentality as well. But um, I just, I guess I just work for relap- like future relapses. Uh, Parham, you know, my thought would be, you know, I, again, uh, there's a paucity of uh, information and it's not uh, uh, Katie's fault, but, you know, uh, my questions would be: Was he using before? And 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 I guess she's really trying to say if he's on his own and he wants to get clean and he doesn't want to make a big uh, show about it, what should he do? And and the only thing uh, you know, well, there's a lot of things that you know. This thing is about your readiness to change and so forth. But you know, I think one of the things, Param, and tell me what you think. And again, I don't know if he has resources to books or online stuff in there. But uh, start utilizing uh, mindfulness techniques and meditation and reading about it. I mean, uh, that, that, that's where my mind goes if we're talking about essentially a guy who's going to keep it all a secret and wants to stand on his own two feet in that situation. Uh, I think what I would say is, you know what? Uh, it, he doesn't have obviously an iPhone in there, but uh, try to utilize uh, meditative and mindfulness techniques. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Parham, and uh, and I, I don't know what access he has to resources there. <clears throat> yeah, you know, the, the part about readiness to change and motivation to change really stands out to me because whether a person is behind bars or a person is free, if they don't have that willingness to change, it honestly doesn't matter what environment they're in, right? And it's a little bit harder here because it doesn't sound like the resources yeah. are available. Do you know, do you know if there's a, any type of 12-step or support groups that come into the jail system there? Do you know if they, they come um, in? There, well, you know what? Where, where, yeah, there are. Where he is at the moment in like a, a unit that focuses on um, uh on not like just general overall rehab um so but i'm sure there's drug use in there as well but as i said at the moment he's doing quite well um 
I think I think something that might help as well, not, you know, just kind of an all-encompassing view, not just him, but, you know, anyone in that situation, is I find that people need something to cling to, something to identify with, like a cult like a culture where whether you know they they identify themselves with a gang culture so maybe identifying himself with something um you know religious or um religiously speaking or or otherwise um because otherwise they just identify themselves as i'm a gangster and and that's what i do i take drugs and that's it and it's just their mentality so that's what i find yeah, it's anyway. actually called it's actually called a sense of identification and a sense of purpose. So what we would hope for him is to create a new identification, a new identity, a new persona that's around the, the world of recovery and abstinence and sobriety. And sometimes that does look weak, or it, sometimes it does look like it's uh, this person's copping out or this person's doing what's not appropriate for him to do. But you know what? After a long time of addiction and getting incarcerated back and forth, at some time in life, you gotta let go of that old self. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, 15 years, I mean, how much, how much, how many more years does somebody want to hold on and cling on to? I'm not saying that's what he's doing right now, but if he, he says, I just can't let go of this or it makes me look weak or it's uh, it's something we just don't do it behind jail. Or we don't do it behind bars. It's like a machismo thing. At some time, you just got to let go of that stuff, you know, and it's, uh, I don't know when that time comes for him or for others out there, but I know that time comes because I've met people that are reformed uh, gangsters. I've met people that are reformed bad guys and all that kind of stuff like that, that have been incarcerated, been behind bars, and they're the most spiritual, kindest, loving, um, recovered people that I've ever met. So that's a possibility. But Katie, I'm gonna flip this around since we have you here right now. Are you ready for a little flip? How are you doing in the midst yep. of all this? How are you personally doing? I'm fine. I. Society? Katie? Regardless of what, sorry, his sobriety. Yeah, regardless of how he's doing, how are you holding up to oh, all sorry, this? I had my finger over the mic. I'm just I'm curious. Okay. I, um, I, I, I keep myself busy. I'm studying social work at the moment. So um, I feel like that could be, um, you know, it could, I suppose, um, uh, arm me with some uh some helpful tools that i might need when he when he gets out you know and he's a little bit more um you know m mentally damaged than before he went in but um yeah i'm okay i just keep myself busy and i'm hoping he got deported so he can't come back to australia but he actually has two children here not mine um but I look after them as much as I can. Crazy, but they would take yeah, make away sure from, keep, make, uh, make sure you keep taking care of yourself through this whole process. Yeah, Katie, I think, go ahead, Pam. I just said, Katie, make sure you're also prioritizing yourself through this whole process. You know, it's a, uh, you're a social worker. That means you're, you're by trade about to become a, um, a professional caretaker, if you will. And someone that knows a lot about uh, helping out yeah, other human well, beings. So make sure you're always putting yourself number one on that list, Katie. Oh, uh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but yeah. It's, it's, it's good advice. Katie, I have a quick question. Uh, and uh, Dana, we see you. We'll get you on. But I have a quick question. What's, uh, you keep turning, and I'm trying to read the Arabic on your necklace. I think it's Arabic. Uh is that the Arabic letters on your necklace? Yes, it is. Yeah, so let me see if yeah. I can read it. it uh, it's an angel. Oh, what is it? What did she say? She said it says angel. So in Farsi, that would be finished. No, I don't know what that is. No, it says Allah. No. No, she said it says angel. So in oh, Farsi, okay. it would be finished. But I don't know what it is in it's Arabic. Supposed okay. To say angel. Okay, yeah, all right. No, I was just curious, sir. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I think you should take care of yourself. Thank you. I think you should come back on and tell us how you're doing. I think there's a little bit of a, uh, you said you're studying social work, uh, and it seems to me like uh, you are much more interested in giving to others and uh, really stretching the bandwidth there versus yourself. 
it's amazing to give to others, oh. but but you gotta also keep yourself I whole. Love so my you can mother do it. as well. She's my she's my number one friend. She's your what? My mother's my number one priority, so I look after her. Jeez. But, so your uh, so um, your plan is to take care of the whole world. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I look after you. Know, I have to look after my mother. She looked after me for you know most of my life, so you have to. Wow, uh, very cool. Um, um, come on and keep us updated. I'm kind of uh, curious to see how you're doing. Uh, pop on here. I know you're in Australia and the connection's kind of crappy today, but but uh, uh, keep yeah. us updated on how things are going and how he's doing. Will do. Okay. Thank you. You got okay. it. Okay. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, come on. Uh, I I don't know what the am I in danger taking metformin with alcohol? That's that's the question. Di are you a diabetic? I guess. Uh, hold hold on. Let me get Dana and I'll get to you. We got Dana. I think she came over from uh, 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 TikTok. D Dana or Dana? I think it's Dana. Hello. Dana, can you hear us? Can you hear her? Maybe it's a bad connection. Okay, then I'm going to take you off and then pop, uh, uh, um, pop her back on. I'm just going to take you off then, uh, then and then put you back on. Should I try it? Sure, yeah. I'm right here. Dana, is that better? Dana, you might want to uh, uh, leave the room and then come back in, and uh, and that might work. Well, I see her thing bleeping, but uh, oh, there uh, she is. Oh, hi. Well, we got a video this time, so let's get the audio in. Dana, we can't hear you. I don't think she's trying to. Oh, she, I think she's setting up. I see her putting headphones in. Hi. Oh, Hi, there you are. are you talking Hi. to me? No, yeah. yeah. We were trying to Hi, am I actually it. on here? Yeah. Yeah, you are. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Thank you. You're, you're live on YouTube. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. I'm like so nervous now. It's okay. Um, it's going to be great. Well, I, I just I wanted to say thank you for being able to talk to me. That's crazy. Um, and, and I guess my question is, I think I posted it. I know you guys talk a lot about addiction um, with substances and, and, and I've read about that and, and, and you know, followed your channels. Um, but do you do anything with people who suffer from uh, like Stockholm syndrome or you mean, trauma? Yeah. You mean, like, sorry. You mean uh, when you say Stockholm syndrome, I'm going to take a guess and uh, presume you're referring to Stockholm syndrome from complex PTSD and long term abuse. Yes, correct. Yeah. And yeah, trauma. Yes, yeah, trauma, PTSD, yeah. uh, trauma, and then um, trauma bonding, uh, and then uh, Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. Uh, Palom, I just want to ask a couple of questions, but it's more appropriate if you take this. Uh, now, uh, I'm just curious, uh, uh, are you in a, some sort of a relationship where this has been going on for quite some time for you? 
Yeah. yeah. As a child, I had, uh, you know, I went a dysfunctional family, I guess I would say, but I'm, I'm from Connecticut. Not that that's anything great, um, but raised just very Catholic, Roman Catholic, Portuguese dad. My mom was just had a bad home life, so she sort of was codependent. My dad was sort of very uh, strict, and at the time he couldn't really see that. So there was a lot of conflict and dysfunction within my family life. Uh, and then I met my husband at a very young age, at 16, um, because I had like a really early bedtime at nine and, you know, we were, it was just very old school way to be raised. So, you know, I wasn't really allowed to leave the house unless I was married or I could go to college, but I had to stay home. So yeah, I've been with him for a long time. I got married six days after I turned 21 and we've had girls, two girls, um, like right away. And yes, he had, um, he had a lot of anger issues, which I thought at the time, you know, my mom was a really kind person, but she had a lot of bad, really bad things happen to her um, by her family. And she was the only one who survived. Everyone else committed suicide. So, um, and she just passed my birthday on June 14th. So it's really starting to hit me right now. Uh, I tend to be strong. But um, yes, I've been with this same person. Uh, we have had to divorce in 2009 because of an arrest. Um, my mom was put into the system at 16 in Hartford, because back then it was a little bit safer, uh, after she was molested from the age of three to 16 by her father, her grandfather, her brother, and her uncle. So she met my dad like right off the boat at 18 from Portugal. And you know, she did the best that she could, but I sort of fell into the same pattern. And um, so I have no self identity whatsoever. And I have suffered uh, physical, mental, emotional, and I'm not one to feel bad for myself. I, I it took a long time to learn that I'm part of this problem. Um, you know, he had gotten arrested in 2009 and he needed to do court mandated, uh, you know, uh, like a therapy to find out. And they found out he had no empathy, which we had seen, uh, you know, I'd seen signs of that when we were dating, he would have blackouts and attack people. But then it sort of turned t towards me because we had money problems and he wanted me, you know, he was, he was violent even, uh, right after I had my daughter, which was pretty much right away. Um, but then when I had to go to work, it became like a jealousy thing. And I had never even been really out in the workforce. I left my college, got married, got engaged at 19. And um, I worked at an investment firm and, and uh, just, you know, just praying so glad that we could fix our bills because he could never handle bills and uh, money. Um, and I, it just spiraled from there. Um, and, you know, I was told he had no empathy and, and we did get divorced and he had a restraining order and he was very sorry. And I, I didn't press any charges and we finally got through it through like a family member. I like can't even talk. Take your time. Yeah, don't feel rushed. Take a couple of deep breaths. You're doing a really great job. Honestly, I really mean it. You're doing a great job. Uh, you're a great historian and, and we're listening to every word you're saying. Thanks. Um, yeah, like a family member, like a family friend, uh, like my sister's husband, they're, he's the youngest of nine and they're pretty big in the town that we live in, police, lawyers, whatever. So we're just sort of, so I'm just sort of like the shameful one, you know, the one that is in this dysfunctional relationship and they're, you know, but she did help us with that. Um, and because my daughter at the time was in the home when he threw a center island at me and I think Coke cans, I don't remember. I, I was working and paying all the bills and buying him quads and going on vacations with my firm. And, you know, I, I doing the violence was still very much so there. They called um, DCF. So that was my whole point about uh, my mom being put into the system that that traumatized me because I was so afraid. You know, I grew up and my mom would say, you know, you walk out of this house, Dana, 
you put on a face and you make it look good, you know? She'd spit my face in the morning, scream and yell at me, and I knew I needed to go to school and get good grades and be class prep and just be be fine, and I was. I was able to do that. And um, so when I knew that they got involved, I, I, uh, they came and said I needed to divorce him, which wasn't the first time I had been told by, you know, my doctor, my like primary care that it was unsafe and unhealthy. The amount of the extreme anxiety that I was under in the relationship. But um, once they came to my house, which was on my birthday, my girls were bouncing in a dress and I just remember them saying, you know, you need to divorce them. And at this point he had a full restraining order, but he still had um, rights to see them. So he would get at them every other weekend. And uh, the communications that we had um, were very violent and very threatening. And when my girls were there, they didn't have food. They were, had no clothing. You know, they had no bed sheets. They had, um, my oldest had gotten injured at the time. They were nine and 11, I think, or maybe no, no, less than that, six and nine. Um, and she had gotten injured, like on a play ski and, you know, he called me and he like insisted that he take the younger one when, I, when Emily was screaming and I'm like, I need to take her to the doctor. And, you know, I just didn't handle things properly. Like DCF was out of the picture right away. They knew that there was no, you know, abuse, sexual abuse. I would never allow that. Uh, I, I always dealt with my children because if I didn't, he, he would lose control right away so i've i've always never really asked him uh, anything at all he doesn't care like to say good night or hi or good morning or do they need anything I, I don't know so i've just created these moments and i knew to handle everything you know so um after that you know he still had access to them and i knew that even you know, showing up in court and dropping the charges because <clears throat> there was no one to really advocate for me. I had never been through this, you know, I was still working. Uh, I just dropped everything and uh, I needed to get him to sign off so I could take the girls away to Florida and he wouldn't do that. And the girls weren't safe. So I remarried him in less than 30 days to keep them safe. And, um, that was in 2011. And then I stopped working, collecting unemployment. Uh, and um, when I went back to work, the abuse did not stop. And I got in a car accident. And um, I, the, I don't know, no one still knows how it happened. It was a new BMW. I, I had hit two telephone poles in the middle of the day. I was back working just part time because I wasn't comfortable going back to work because of the trust issues. And I have no self esteem. I didn't even know who, I still don't know who I am. But um, so I got in an accident and then um, the abuse just got worse. He um, abused me badly and then got arrested in 2014. But I didn't mean to call the police. I actually hung up, but he, he told me to call them back. And uh, I did, and they took him and they took him without his phone or whatever. And I was really trying this time. Now my daughters were 16 and 13 and they did not want to see him. And uh, he had his own phone and his own uh, plan and all this new number. And I had mine, you know, domestic violence protected and he was still attached to my phone and, uh, he would answer it when I wouldn't pick up. He just so I can't even think like, I've been pushed through walls, choked, left on the side of the road, choked in my car. My kids have been left on the side of the road in different States. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's been a lot, and I and I stay. I, I I leave, but I come back because it's like all I know, and 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 
he works, but he can't pay the bills. He never has been able to. He, I can't talk to him, like, say, hey, can we just sit down and work out a budget? It's okay if we don't have money. Like, we just need to be able to communicate and be kind because that's what's most important. And I want to show my girls, you know, that you should have respect and love each other. And it's not money. It does not go, you know, it doesn't, I mean, yes, everyone needs money, but you can't take it with you when you go and we're teaching our kids and they've seen so many horrible things that have affected my health and my so he did a lot of bad things to me and i couldn't leave my home for two years uh convinced that i had uh, something wrong with my face and um obviously i have a psychiatrist who said that I had body dysmorphic disorder, but I had become physically ill in 2016 very suddenly um, after this whole thing of me telling him I was going to leave and him throwing me through a wall. And my daughter at the time was 18 and she called the police and I made her lie because I promised him I would never call the police again in 2014, which pretty much I think sealed my fate. I got very ill. They couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, they thought... Finally, later on, because I kept having these weird things that I should see a toxicologist. Uh, I, at that time, I couldn't even imagine, think that, but, but he does work with those kinds of chemicals and herbicides and pesticides, but I didn't even want to think about that. And uh, it's just been one thing after another. And uh, I don't do drugs. I've never smoked a cigarette. Uh, um, my medication that they put me on is uh, Xanax, um, obviously. And uh, they put me on Zoloft in 2016, my first antidepressant, which I'm not big on. After my accident, I wasn't like getting much care. He wasn't taking care of me. And I must have passed out because I had the kids or something. They thought maybe it was a seizure, so they started me on Lamictal. Uh, and then I was on blood pressure medication because I had a really high pulse. I've always had tachycardia as a child. So Tobrol and Lysinopril. And uh, that's why in 2016 to have all this weird stuff happen to my health where my pulse was really high and my blood pressure was really low and I had like uh, cystitis and just they, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I, they diagnosed me with like hypoglycemia. Um, looking back now, because I've returned again, and my cat got very sick, and she drinks and eats out of my food. Um, she got oddly sick. It affected her eyes. The vet couldn't figure it out. Now, like a year and a half later, she has diabetes, and she's very ill. Um, and he works with cool chemicals uh, for like, you know, for the town, for Parks and Rec. So he's, he's exposed to all that. And at that time when it happened to me, I would never think somebody would do that. But he couldn't keep beating the crap out of me anymore because my girls knew. And, and, and before I could hide it, I, I can't, I couldn't hide it anymore. So... You know, I, I feel there aren't a lot of avenues for people to help women because they have this stigma of like go to a shelter you know or try to make a plan and i and i have done that and once he found out and i told you know he knew i was saving to leave it, 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 it that was in 2016 my rings which i don't lose anything i mean i have my mohair sweaters from high school went missing and they were big rings that i that i had bought um and I got very sick, just a lot of thrown through wall, like whatever, a lot of things happen and I've never recovered from that mentally, like something's just wrong. Um, so I had, you know, a neurologist obviously, and I'm fine neurologically, they can't find anything, CAT scans, MRIs, EEGs, a neuropsych exam, I'm fine neurologically for my age, psychologically, I am not. And I'm just wondering, at this point, you know, because I think there's a stigma, they, you know, like, and I'm not better than anybody, you know, when we, before I started working, uh, we would be on food stamps and collect with when our kids were young because we were struggling. But like, I can't, 
I can't just take my kids are older now and they're not they're they're so confused because I'm not the person that I used to be. I can't even. I just I don't know what to do. Um, then, and I talk I'll, to a lot of people. I, ju I just have a quick quick question. Uh, have you ever had a therapist? Yes. They're very short lived because A, he finds out. Uh, he'll, like, I got a domestic violence counselor when I came back. I went away to South Carolina to try to see if I, my dad was there. And yes, so to answer your question, yes. But they tell me to leave. And, like, now. And we, were, we went to, like, a counselor counselor through my psychiatrist. Um, and he said he couldn't help us. He said, you know, d there's just been so much more. A lot of it I don't. I mean, I do remember some of it, but I can't even talk about it. I did cognitive behavioral therapy, like this tapping. That really was hard because it was just ended up being, it's just all too much. It's just all too much. And the lady looked at me like, what the hell? I just said so much that I haven't even said to you. So um, that didn't help me. I just sort of went to bed for several hours. Um, this has, has physical effects on me and mental and my, even my girls. I mean, so yes, I have seeked therapy. I've had doctors tell me uh, to get away from him. I've had ER doctors. I've had uh, friends, obviously, family. Uh, but my parents were divorced and lived in separate states, so our, our family was sort of not, not really... Um, a family anymore and then my friends moved away so and we're secluded as it is you know we're very secluded so having the pandemic happen didn't even really affect us when i couldn't finally go anywhere or look myself in the mirror he said that he was uh, and he doesn't share his feelings or talk to me about anything other than bad hateful things um um, but he I, said, I, you know, I, I'm good now. Like, I'm not, I'm fine. Like, I hated you for who you were or how you looked. And I'm not interested in men. I don't look at men. I love my husband very much. Um, and he said, I was just really jealous. And, and now that you can't, you know, I see how much you suffered. Like, I'm over it now. And, you know, I'll take you somewhere. And that really shocked me, you know. I think uh, Pat Hum and I have a pretty good sense of what's going on, and but I'm going to let Pat Hum the lead because he's uh, the expert on this stuff. So uh, 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 I'll let him uh, give you some. And uh, you know what? Uh, thank you for sharing so much with us. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I, I said so much. I just. No, no, we're, we're good with it. But I'll let Pat Hum lead on this one because I don't want to put my foot in my mouth uh, and uh, – because uh, this is, uh, you know, again, I'm not a therapist, but uh, I'll let Pat Home handle this. Yeah, um, yeah, Dana, also, I want to say thank you for sharing that, um, your history with us on such a, you know, open and, and honest and transparent way. Uh, just before I get into my, um, what I would say to you is, I was reading the side chat sidebar, and there were so many females, I would say maybe five or six or maybe seven of them, that identified with your story and they their heart went out to you and they had a lot of compassion. And some of them have um, been able to achieve uh, some type of success through it. Some of them are still going through it. Some of them, their children are going through the same cycle again. So I want you to know that there's a lot of support there in a safe way for you to interact with and engage with. They, they actually listened to what you had to say and it meant a lot to them. So please don't underestimate what's available to you there. Um, some of the stuff that stood out to me about 2016 when you started sharing about your health, declining health, I'm a big believer that trauma is stored in the body, okay? Uh, trauma is definitely stored in the body. Uh, there's a good book called The Body Keeps Score. Yeah. Uh, it's a safe way for you to be able to buy something on Amazon or get the audio books or something, just listen to it passively. I would strongly suggest it. And there's another book called Toxic Stress by Gabor Mate that talks about the impact of stress and chronic illness and both of those books combined together would be really valuable for you you know and 
I don't know. I'm not a trauma expert or specialist, but I do know that at my facility, we do treat trauma and our, and our trauma specialist, our clinical supervisor, which Dr. B, one of the weeks she's interested in coming on here and providing support. Oh, but, please. Tell us yeah, she's a big believer of EMDR, you know, and, and that, so. That, that's what I need. I, I can't get out of this myself. I feel like it's almost like a witness. I need help from myself. Like if I, when I leave the situation, I'm not sick. I'm not physically sick. Uh, and I, and I don't think anyone would be doing anything to me and I'm able to get up and do things. Uh, but when I'm here, it's, I, I, I need help. Like, and I'll still come back. Yeah. Sounds like it. It's, um, but you know, have you ever tried EMDR modality? Because I know with cognitive behavior therapy, uh, as soon as you start getting into the thoughts, you're going to disassociate the way you kind of almost did today. You know, there's a physiological effect that you experience. There's some hypervigilance. There's some uh, heart racing. I noticed that you were kind of almost disassociating. And when you start getting into those thoughts, that's just where you go. But if trauma is stored in the body, you know, EMDR allows you to access those, um, those memories without having to get into the cognitive realm with it. And it helps you shift some of the negative conditions and kind of allows you to show up in that moment. And, you know, sometimes people have a fear of engaging into that uh, type of work or anything like that. But the best advice I can give is uh, sometimes you have to cut the arm to save the body. It might be a few months of very uh, uncomfortable work that you have to get through. But you just shared with me a history going back to your childhood of multi-generational patterns and cycles to get to the other side of what you've gone through, let alone your own side of the story, you know, just what you've experienced as an adult to go through what you've experienced your entire life. Uh, it's going to be painful through it. But man, I mean, just hearing your story That's right sweet. now, That's I can't see it being any more painful than what you've already experienced. So um, yeah, no, I knew about a lot of bad things at a young age, but I just took it as, okay, I'm jaded, you know, yeah, like I'm no, a little jaded. It. I'll use it in a good way, not to scare my kids. You know, I wanted them to see the world. I didn't want to shelter them and make them afraid. This has changed every part of me. I am, I have no idea who I am and I can't help my own self. So it is an addiction. It's a bad, very scary one. Yeah. But you know, you're asking, you're, you're asking for help. So with any other addiction, the first step of any addiction, I mean, I don't even care, you know, what, what you, what program you subscribe to or believe in the first step of transforming and changing and healing the healing journey is what you're looking for, Dana. The number one um, part of the healing journey is, asking for help and saying, Hey, I need help with this. I can't do it on my own. Right. right. It's I can't do right. it on my own. That's what you're doing right now. So now it's a matter of taking what you're doing right now in a safe way. I understand your situation might not be as easy as, Hey, I got to go get some help, but re get that book. At least start with that book. The body keeps score, get a little bit of insight, some awareness, some, some knowledge. Uh, you know, you, you sound like a very intellectual human being. I have a feeling that you'll be able to read and comprehend and understand. So, so Thank take advantage you. of that. You know, some people don't have that ability. Take advantage of that ability and kind of find yourself a little bit, find your voice a little bit, realize the, the impact that's actually being done, not just what an ER doctor is going to say. Because, uh, you know, Dr. B is a unicorn here. He knows a, a lot about right. everything. Not every right. ER doctor. Not every ER doctor is going to be as knowledgeable as Dr. B is. So. I know. That's why I'm like so overwhelmed, but I'm even on here. I feel yeah. uh, that's why I'm that's saying exactly. so much because like. I'm just so thankful. Like, I'm so sorry to put all this on you. Like, I'm so thankful that I get this opportunity because people will say it's just anxiety or it's stress. But I'm telling no, no. you, leaving, leaving when you have nothing and trying to make a foundation and worrying about your kids and doing it, like, that's stress. That's, that's, that's stress. When you're home with your family and your husband, that, that shouldn't be stress. Like, it, it's, that should be peace. So... so Okay, sorry, uh, if I may, uh, I'm yeah. do mine. So let me just be really <clears throat> clear. Uh, uh, I'm not a therapist, okay? So I I'm a pro licensed professional health guy, but I'm not. But uh, the the uh, psychological construct that you're describing of yourself and what you've gone through, okay? And the, and you made a reference uh, early on. Uh, that obviously you've done some reading and have an understanding that, you know, this is at least in a theoretical framework being compared to Stockholm syndrome and even being said, said that this should be looked at as like Stockholm syndrome. All of that said, Pyron pointed something out. Uh, uh, you're highly intelligent and uh, you could pick that out. Uh, number one, the way you describe what you're saying. Number two, 
uh, your work history and making things work. So number that's the number one. Uh, number two, I, I was curious how you found us because usually people find us through substance abuse, but uh, you know that was just sort of a little, little bit of an intellectual and clinical curiosity. Number three, um, I can tell you this: you said something, and you said that this is like an addiction, and in fact. Uh, I'm not sure if they made, uh, uh, I got to look this part up because I don't know if they've made the physiological correlation yet and looked at that functional imaging, but it is exactly like substance abuse. And I, I do know this, and I'm going to tell you this, uh, the longer you continue this, uh, you will have uh, actual brain changes, okay? Okay. And you will have, you will suffer a lot of the same type of uh, pathological processes, whether it's the primary issue or an extension of, that uh, your partner may be suffering from. Again, I don't know him, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm just speculating. Uh, and, and I suspect even at this point, you may have, remember, I'm not a therapist, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. I suspect just from your behavior, yeah, you probably have now developed both anxiety, depression, uh, a completely fractured sense of yourself. You probably have uh, uh, episodes of depersonalization, derealization, an incredible amount of helplessness and hopelessness, and almost like you're in a Kafkaesque nightmare that you can't get out of. Uh, and I could be wrong about this, but... Uh, so this, huh? am I wrong? You, no, oh, you're okay. not wrong at all. Okay. And, uh, and with that comes the idea, remember, it's a nightmare. It's not real. Okay. With that comes the idea of what do I do? So two, the average clinical worker, the ER doc, or even your primary care, very few people really, really understand the toll of this kind of abuse, except people that have lived it and the therapists that, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, have to deal with this. And, you know, the Param give you some insights about sort of where to begin. So that's your other problem, right? Uh, just so you know, in certain countries, this is actually uh, recognized by the legal systems in family courts, right? Here, the legal system's like, oh, you know, the guy's beard. Okay. So I don't know what your resources are. I uh, deeply, deeply empathize with you. I, I think I understand where you're at, uh, and I was trying to convey that to you. And uh, uh, I don't know what family social support you have. In fact, one of the most insulting and painful things a loved one or a, dear, a near person to you can say is, to not validate your feelings. It's almost like you're in a concentration camp and you're trying to tell your mother or sister or brother about it. And they're like, ah, live with it or do this. And it's just devastating. So you're in a tough place. In fact, I think you've gone so far in this situation because one would think the kids are grown up now. I can bounce. And you are a hostage to your own uh, cognitive, emotional, and psychological paradigm that's created by the perpetrator. You're so right. Oh, I mean, you're spot on. It's it's overwhelming. And my daughter has a dissociative disorder by finally yeah, seeking counseling when I left. And um, so, so they're actually just as confused because I can't be a good example to them. It's not even that. It's a, and you keep blaming yourself. This all stems from what you've all been subject to from day one. Uh, and it's very, uh, this issue is intergenerational, just like the other stuff, Parhamanai. So all of that said, I think we're both at a loss, Parhamanai, of, uh, well, how do I guide her? She's in Connecticut, right? Uh, you know. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in like uh, Simsbury, like Avon Farmington that area so it's sort of like a hoity-toity area so my family oh i love that area it's one of the best studies <laughs> in the history of medicine from over there the uh yeah. heart study 
Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, no, I, and I used to invest in, in a pension firm, uh, and it wasn't like uh, I just found a really great, strong woman, and I was able to do it and just work really hard to get us out of this. Uh, pa- and I tried pa- to save, but what do you think of this? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Really, what about online support groups of people? You know, would that be a good place for her to start? Uh, I think a lot of people uh, find solace. Uh, from this situation online uh, with support groups. And I, I can give you a cup, uh, couple of That's sites. That's what I was looking for. And I do want to seek solace. I know he's tracked uh, tracked my phone. He tracks everything. He, And that's fine. I mean, it's it's fine. I, I've accepted that. I, I just know I need to get out. They need to get out before I can't make this better they don't like try to heal them try to be strong try to overcome this try to i don't even want to place blame because i believe that he can't even recognize it he can't what he's, he has no insight right he has no feeling whatsoever and it's easy for people to say like my family like dana you choose this you choose the drama you could leave like da, da, da. It, it's so easy for them to brush me off or and then my little sister like i didn't really want to tell her you know, I didn't, I was ashamed. So, and I, I could, you know, cover those things up with my older sister who I would go to, who's really well known here in this area is more like, uh, get over yourself, you know, like get over Really? Yourself. After all these years of, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm, yeah. They, they're, they're, we have a dysfunctional family, so it's not. Oh yeah. Do me a favor. Here's what I can do. Uh, send an email to, uh, I don't know which email. Uh, I think I have like six of them, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, send an email. I think it's dot, uh, get that uh, for this channel. It's in the link. Uh, get Dr. B, I think, or something. Uh, get Dr. B. Send an email. There's multiple people that uh, see it, and uh, they'll send it. And what I want to do is, at the very least, the least I can do is send you to some a few online communities that I think uh, – are very supportive and uh, and uh, uh, I don't know to what extent you need education about it. Sometimes when we formalize an understanding of shit being thrown at us, it's easier to deal because it's no longer a mystery what's going on. And right. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so I can uh, at least guide you towards some of these guys. I can't do anything for you because uh, it's so complex you need someone skilled uh and uh, yeah uh, i and, need and, like it's almost like witness protection like i need someone to take my cell phone i need someone to help my kids give us make sure that we're safe it's like it's like it's insane it's not something you know that you can just walk away from it's just I'm gonna, it's not i'm gonna slightly disagree with you do need all those things but i think you need a cognitive change yourself. Of oh, yeah. How, I yeah. need help. My brain yeah, yeah. Is, is not okay. Like, I don't know who I am. I mean, yeah. when I did my neuropsych, they were like, you, what do you like to do? What do you, makes you happy? I have no idea. I don't, I'm very depressed. I, 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 cause I'm suffered a lot of, I mean, very bad. Yeah, Thanks. so that, that's what I can do. Um, give me one second. I gotta, I'm just still overwhelmed, but I'm even on here. This is the first time I've ever been on anything on live. Other than like, on, guys. like a I boss apologize. or something. I got a patient issue. I'll be right there. Pat, can okay. you give me one second? Don't leave that. Yeah. You know, Dana, you know how you said this is uh, the first time you've been on anything like this outside of a work situation? And, and you came on here and you were able to, with so much... Um, strength and confidence you're able to come share and talk, that's telling me that you're actually able to do things that you otherwise thought you wouldn't be able to do, right? So this experience right now proves to yourself and, and many other people that you actually are capable of doing things that your mind tells you is something that you're unable to do, you're too afraid to do, you're too anxious to do, to your, you're too scared to do, right? So now I want you to think of other areas in your life when it comes to this entire situation, right? Can there possibly be other ways of going through what you're going through that your mind might tell you this is impossible, this is too difficult, this is too hard, I don't think I can ever do it. However, just like you were able to do this, 
you might be able to do that. And I don't know what that is, right? But I'm telling you, yes. there are some limiting beliefs that you have that have you stuck in where you, the situation you're in right now. Like a byproduct of all of the things you've done and all the things you've thought and all the things that you felt has led you to this moment. Now, if you start doing different things and start thinking different ways and start feeling different ways, can that lead you to a different moment that doesn't feel like the one you're actually going through right now? The answer is yes. And I'm telling you this from personal and professional experience. The answer is yes. However, there is a line of fear that you have in a line of I don't think I can get it to the other side because look what happened in 2009. Look what happened again when we got back together. Look what happened in 2016. Your past and it's is continuously this. happening. So you're right. Yeah. My fear is that I can't do it here because sure. I'm it's constant. It's not going to stop. So so it's like I'm drowning and someone's pushing me under. So I know I can't do it here. But then when I leave, I'm not strong enough and I can't heal long enough and I can't to get to make sure that I never go back because I still have that fear. So it's like it's. I'm not trying to make an excuse because because yeah. I, I if, if I I've tried many times, uh, but I come back, and it, it's something that is not okay with me. I am so dependent on him, like where I I wouldn't people wouldn't make me afraid from the things that I've experienced in my life or seen my mom. Like people don't make me afraid. I. I'm so afraid. Yeah. Like just talking about it, I, I, I can't, I'm like frozen. I, I, I make, I can't, I'm so afraid and I just want to make it better before it's, it's too late for my girls at least so that they knew that their mom was strong, you know? And I know that, that I cannot do it alone. And I, I, if I could, I would, I, and maybe possibly I could, but I, I I've tried. And I've always come back because it's, it's not a, hey, lovey. I'm so sorry. What did you mean? I'm on a live. Can I, can I come right back? I'm talking to these really great people. I, I know I'm never on. But she's so shocked. I'm never on anything. Yes. All right. Yeah, I'm on the live. Okay. I love you. I hope you relaxed. I love you so much. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. You don't. That's, that's cool. Your life? It's okay. That's, that's my a good part. That's good part. She went to no, go paint. Okay. Yeah. And you Did know, I so just... what I gathered from your children's ages is one of them 22 and one of them 18 now? Yeah, she just turned 19. Mm -hmm. 19. Okay. This is a, I mean, I, I can't give advice on anything like this, Dan. I'm not going to give advice, but uh, I could tell you in a suggestion, a kind suggestion that if there was a time right now for you to start seeking your personal healing journey, with your children being in that age that they're kind of transitioning into young adulthood, if you will, this is your time right now. Because if your children were five and six and seven and eight, I understand. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna suggest that somebody just gets up and figures out what they have to do on their own because there's a, there's a, a, a maternal, you know, that that sense of obligation to kind of be there for your kid. But right now, you got to be there for you, whatever that means for you. If you know, if you tell me multiple times, Param, I think I have to get away to heal to work on myself and then from that point make a decision. The reason why you're saying that is because you know that if you keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna keep getting what you're getting and the same results, right? And your children, by the way, are able to, are capable to have conversations with you about this topic that we're talking about. Just you three can have a conversation. Yes, we have, my, my I bet, oldest. I bet they and, have. And I'm I'm very grateful that they even I bet they have, you know, these are, these are because oh, they're, I they're wouldn't emotionally mature. Either. They're emotionally mature, Dana. These kids, these kids get it. They know that they want their mom healthy and they want their mom safe. So again, I can't give you direct um, you know, feedback on anything like that, but I will tell you this: the time to put Dana number one is now. Absolutely. Now, whatever, whatever that means to you, Dana, all I can tell you is the time to put yourself number one in your life finally for the first time ever, not since the time you were a little kid, because even when you were a kid, that never happened for you. So for the first time ever. The time to do it right now because tomorrow, next week, next month, next year might be too late. And Dana, I'm going to add something to that. And here, uh, Parham Thank caught you. something. Again, I hear some of the things you say to me. And uh, uh, you, you're you the one right now that needs the, 
uh, uh, health and mental health issues. But check this out. You're, you're describing this kind of state of fear, anxiety, can't do But look at what you just did. You just came on live on YouTube. I don't know how many people are watching this. Uh, hundreds at least will eventually, a couple of thousand will see this. And that takes a lot of courage. So that tells me even more. And again, you're very cognitively sophisticated. Uh, 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 Thank you. And, 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 uh, and so uh, if you think there's not something there, there is something there. But I urge you to, uh, and I understand that you, you absolutely need solid professional help uh, of the uh, Parham's type of people, right? Uh, uh, Parham specialty, I guess, is something else. And you got to get one that's good. Now, to that end, uh, like I said, uh, I'm gonna, and I want you to come on here regularly and start chatting with us because I find this itself to oh, be if I, you know, I'm still with him. If I, I, I didn't even think about, like, because I'm usually just down. He likes me down. If I get up, like, it, it's I understand. But you know what? I don't care what you come and chat to us about. Come and tell me about Connecticut and the weather because we'll know what we're talking about. Me, you, and Power Home, and we'll know what the deal is. And if you need to get on here, we're never going to initiate. So let's make some ground rules with her, Power Home. Uh, we'll never initiate the topic when she comes on. Uh, and if she wants to, she can come on. And I, uh, we're both well-versed in many topics. Shit, you can call in, uh, come on and ask about high school basketball. And so anytime, and that will be our cue. Whatever you start talking about, we'll switch. But come on regularly. Send me that email, and uh, I will do my best to guide you. Uh, to uh, but, but you got to do this. And your girls seem cognitively sophisticated and emotionally strong. And maybe this but could yeah, be a journey. Yeah, they're struggling. Of they're, they're definitely struggling. I mean, I, I, I get, worry. I they get are. that. And, and so I, maybe, I can't abandon, like, they'll feel abandoned. They don't have a relationship with him at all. No, don't they, abandon them. What I'm saying is maybe the three of you can take this recovery journey together in some ways by first recognition for the need. And that itself is half the battle. And then you can move forward. Um, and then okay. that's I so appreciate what you are doing. Like it's so selfless and so kind. And, and I, I, I can't thank either one of you enough. And just to answer your question, Dr. B, I found you through looking up medication, like the side effects of Lamictal, what it could do for me cognitively, because the last thing I need is to have any other, uh, reasons to not, uh, be completely aware of my situation. So that's how I was looking to see uh, what you knew about that. And I don't, you know what, uh, what I tell my staff and uh, uh, some of my, I said, the, the, just go with the golden rule. I know everything until I tell you otherwise, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. I do know quite a bit about that, that what you asked. Uh, and maybe that's something we can discuss in the future. Um, but send that email, keep, coming on our home uh, is also uh, always has fantastic insight to get people through stuff and maybe little by little this can be uh, a road for you to get to where you need to and uh, we absolutely support you so know that you have some support professional in some ways uh, in this corner with power home and i and the whole thank team. you because i actually saw the two of you live uh and i was Ooh. amazed just at what you were talking about and i really i, I really can't even believe i'm on this I, I i hope he doesn't watch it if if i'm choked or whatever and I, i'm not on here for a couple of weeks then you know or uh, I, I don't know let's just hope that doesn't happen again but get, um, that email, huh? get that email out to me so i can get that info to you then Okay. Thank you guys so very much for everything. You're amazing. Thanks for having me. And um, uh, it, really, it really helped. And I hope for all those other women out there that they stay strong and know that they're not alone. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye uh, thank you. Okay.
Harum, I got uh, med students uh, <laughs> present yeah. the case I'm way over. Oh, we got Abe. Should we uh, Abe? If you go, you got to be quick because I got the, the students waiting to present. The, I got the patients. Uh, go ahead, Abe. Hi. Oh, I saw Abe was clean for some time, and uh, that's yeah, most awesome. Of the house. Uh, and. Uh, and I'll have to take him. Uh, we can't hear you, Abe. Abe, uh, uh, come on next week. Uh, we heard you were clean. We're really proud of you. Uh, in general, everybody, I do have to go. Param, uh, I'm way uh, overdue. Get out of here, Doc. It's okay. Uh, this was a, a great session. Uh, uh, wow, that one really touched me. Uh, a lot of them do, uh, and yeah, I appreciate them coming on. What are we doing next week? And, guys, hey, TikTok, thanks for coming on. Uh, you guys still got to get on that thing. Uh, YouTube, thank you again as usual. Uh, please do the, what is it, like, subscribe, whatever, ring the bell, all that good stuff. Donate to our Patreon. Help us keep all of this going. Um, and, uh, Pat Hum, get, give us some uh, parting words of wisdom and uh and uh, goodbye for next week as we sign off. Well, I'll keep it short because I know you got to get out of here. But um, this is something that both Dr. B and myself look forward to. It's, it's a staple of our week. And our hope is that we were able to provide some, um, some hope and some education and some love and some support uh, to all those who are watching. And, and feel free to uh, share this with other people. If you want to do something for us, a lot of you thank us all the time. If you want to do something for us, uh, please share this with people that you know would benefit from seeing it because we would like nothing more than to see this community continue to grow. Uh, absolutely. We really want to do something. We want a paradigm shift here. Hey, guys, uh, Susan, thank you for your compliments to us. Uh, Dorothy, thank you. Le Leila's is funny. <laughs> Dr. B is a demagogue. Pat Helm, Pat Helm is fantastic, too. Thank you both from the bottom sure. of of my heart. Hey guys, thank you all of you. Keep us in your prayers. Dorothy, thank you and uh, see you guys soon. Uh, that was awesome. Pat Ram, I'll give you a buzz. I gotta see you uh, Okay, bro. go do your thing. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Hey, uh, TikTok, bye. Thank you. Join and uh, get on there so we can give you questions. Bye guys. Better run.